some chains are stronger than others. That's what I try to show you tonight on basis of some research in Emilda. And as Mark said, I'm trying to prepare uh, a thesis application for the University of Leiden. And it means that I will go a little bit deeper than I did up to now. And I will show you the first things of what I did and what I want to do in the next few years. Part of it will be on Belgium. I never did any research in the diaspora of the people of Emirda. And I started with it, and it's really marvelous. OK, just in the, in the time that uh, there was the major paradigm shift from push-pull theory to the chain migration theory, I started to come to Turkey in 75, because I had people from Turkey as students in my volunteering actions on teaching Dutch. And one of the reasons why those first generation Turks don't speak Dutch or Belgian or whatever properly is our lousing teaching, I can tell you. Um, we were not very good teachers at that time. And we wanted, of course, we wanted to see the countries of our pupils from Greece, from Morocco, from Turkey. And we decided to go to Turkey. And those guys in the first years, they didn't want to show their village because it was not modern. And they took us to the cities. And one of the guys, Mustafa Karaisale, from a village in Emirda, Karajalar village, I could persuade him to show his village. And there it started. Very bad slides, but this is the old village of Karajalat in 78. Typical houses of the region. The left is my wife. We were married in uh, 74 and went together to Turkey until the first child came. Welcome to you too. You missed the most inter interesting part. It was about my life. <laughs> This is Mustafa Karaisale. He was alone, of course, in Holland. The family was still in Turkey at that time. That was normal for people living in Holland, for people living in Belgium. Uh, that's another story I will tell you later on. You know, it was so marvelous, those experiences in that time. And those girls, they are now all mothers of four, five children, all living in different places in Holland. And the young guy there, that's me. <laughs> Making bull good. It's nice to, to be in a situation where there's no ele electricity or newly electricity, no water. And of course, we had to go to the well to take water for the cooking of the, of the bull good. This is a wedding. Those people playing music are from the Abdal minority, living from Western China up to the Balkans. Very interesting people. Not too many scientists did research on, on it. The lady with the yellow jacket is living in Denmark. And we went, of course, to the Isla, a few hours walking with the, the donkey. And we met people over there who were doing the laundry, also walking for a few hours with the laundry going, cooking some water over there and doing it. And then a boy, young, young boy, came to us and he said, Spreek you ook Vlaams? Do you know Flemish language? And that's where the curiosity started. How is it possible walking four hours with a donkey and then someone go, coming to you and asking such a stupid question? which is not stupid at all, because most Turks in Belgium are from Emirda. Oh, I'm going back. This is Karajala later on. It's somewhere in the valley. You can see it over there. But now we are going to look, have a look at the houses by then, 95. And our daughters over there, they, are, they may be older than we were when we came there the first time. And this is 
last year, and it's thanks to BIAA, especially to Leo, who said you should put some modern stuff in your lecture at In Motion. We went for a few days to have a nostalgic visit to uh, Emirda, and it was really, it was marvelous to see those people back. And the guy over there is Mustafa Karaisal, and how he's retired and he went back to the village. 92, as Mark said, in the first half of the 90s, I went to Emirda quite frequently <coughs> and did my first observations on ethnicity and on migration over there. 2014. For people who don't know where Emirda is, Ankara, Eskishir, Istanbul. It's just south of Eskishir. And why did I put it on the map, Eskishir? Because Eskishir is far more important as a city than Afyon. There are a few hundred thousand people from Emirda living in, in Eskishir at the moment. And whenever you go to Emirda, always there's some number about 20,000, 21,000, 19,000 inhabitants. And it has a special culture. Uh, there are more places like this in Turkey, but they are proud. They are feeling the Turkmen. They are, uh, I think, really different. And they have own t-shirts. It's, speci it's something special to be Turk in the world and to be from Emirda in Turkey. And they have their own periodicals with the Topakev, the traditional Turkmen tent and their own kilims. And you see a little bit more people with a Turkic uh, outlook over there. And you can see, especially on the uh, Tuesday morning yogurt uh, market, the Ucetek, the traditional clothing of the Turkmen women. I made it a little bit vague because m some people might get hungry when they see this stew, güvec. There was a mayor in the 90s, he was on the Belgian television, and they asked him, why are those people coming every year back to Emirda? And he said, there's only one reason, it's our stew. It's so good, you have to come back. This is also part of the Tuesday market, vegetables, but the, the most important part is the market of the people from the villages, as you see here. And it was totally open air. And the last, the yogurt is on the right side. The last uh, few years ago, they uh, made a roof. This is 2014. From now on, most photographs are from last year. The yogurt is, of course, coming from milk, and the milk is coming from cattle or whatever. It's sheep, especially in Emida. And it's either from the Ayla or, of course, the villages in stables. <coughs> Up to the 90s, most people went to the Ayla every year, and now it's only a few doing so. There were no roads, they had to walk for half a day or one and a half days, some of them. And now you can go by car and nobody is going there anymore, only to picnic. These are the stables in the villages. This is uh, Emirda village and road map, 1990. So it's a small city with some 75 small villages. And you can see it's quite an international community. This is near the village of Karajalar, and it not only shows Emida, but also Paris, Amsterdam, Brussels, Copenhagen. Let's go to the dem demographic situation. Uh, when you take the inhabitants on 100% in 1935, 
Turkey and Emil Dardé start at 100. Turkey ends up at 350, and Emil Dardé ends up in 1990 at some 120, 25. So over half of the population that should have lived there is living somewhere else. And now the situation is better or worse. It depends on how you look at the situation. But when you go to certain villages, I will come to the inter-ethnic situation later, to certain villages, the situation is far more dramatic. And when you ask why don't you have uh, numbers of the situation after 1990, there are, but they are not trustable. And maybe we can discuss this later on. This is, for example, the village Firikli Adayaze, near Emirda. And it has a dramatic diminishing population between 75 and 80. And up to a few weeks ago, I said it has to do only with the fact that the families were coming over to Europe. And of course, one man or one woman with four or five children, it makes a difference. But there's a second reason, because Belgium, where most of them are living, uh, accepted already before the oil crisis, children and women. They encouraged families to come there. There were certain reasons for it. We can discuss it too. And then it has to do with the fact that after the oil crisis, there was a stop on migration. And a stop means that all of a sudden, everybody wants to go out before the, the uh, border is closed, really. And it <coughs> took a few years to be effective. And almost all villages in total went to Belgium and Holland just in that period. <coughs> when you go to Emirda, you see this sign. <coughs> it's about the sister um, municipalities. And then we forget about Pendik, because it's in Turkey. And you have three places, Vienna in France, Ghent in Belgium. We will come to that place and Haarlem in Holland. And when you look at the population from Emirda in these three places, it's at least the same number as in the city of Emirda itself in total. There are at least 12,000 uh, people in Ghent, at least 4,000 in Haarlem, and at least 4,000 in Vienna. The first thing you can say when you look at the situation in Emirda is that bigger units, tribal community, makes stronger chains and makes the migration more massive, faster, and with bigger concentrations in the places they go to. And especially because of the stronger mutual support in a bigger network. And up to now, I looked at this situation from Turkey only, from visiting Emirda. And I will show you later on after the, the things on ethnicity, I will show you that when you go to places like Ghent, you can really see how it works. First of all, the inter-ethnic relation within Emirda. When you study ethnicity in this place, you have to go to the old people who went to Emirda first. And you see a guy called Ali Reza Yalgen, who published in Ülkü, the People's Houses periodical, in November 47. And he's talking about those tents, talking about the food, talking about those noble people, proud Really, with pride, he refers to the nine tribes living there, all of the Oghuz tribal confederation, he says. And he says the first place is taken by the Muslim Jalla. They were in the city center of Emida. And then he has the names of the smaller tribes. The red ones are the ones who are still very much important. Boinu Yunlu, Payat, Emir, Yurel, Morjalla, Ausha, Karaban, Acheken. The second one who wrote from a totally different style, 
and the Ali Riza Yalgan is a little bit, I can say, a Kemalist, um, nost nostalgic. They had, had some kind of nostalgic vision on how the Turks were living when they were nomads. Peter Elford Andrews comes from outside and he looks at Turkey as a whole and says what kind of minorities are living there and he has to make choices. Yalgan is not mentioning other people than Turks and Andrews, he tends to make minorities stranger than they are. And I, I can give some examples of it later on. He published a very, did anyone read or see it at least? It's a very, very massive work like this. And, and very good as a, as a starter. But when you go to a certain district and study it properly, then you see that he didn't visit the regions, but only talked with people from that regions in Europe. He didn't have the money to do so. <coughs> the <coughs> things he says on Emira is that there are people living, Alevi Yuruk Turks. He mentions only two villages. There are at least 10 Yuruk villages, and some of them uh, are Sunni, some of them are Alevi, and none of them are of a certain tribe. Then the Sunni Turkomans. He doesn't divide in, for example, Muslujalı and Boynoyulu, the most important tribes. He just says they are Turkomans and Sunni. Then the stranger thing that you can find in his book is that he starts to write about Shiit, Azerbaijani Turks. So non-Sunni and with some kind of Azerbaijani background, being Turkic, then coming to Emirda and all of a sudden becoming Sunni and no longer Azerbaijani but from Karabakh. Okay, it's in Azerbaijan. 11 villages south of the district center. It's east but that's no problem. Then. Strange mistake, Muslims from the Balkan, especially from Bulgaria. He puts them in the district center while they are not living there, but in a series of villages in the north of Emirda. Sunni Kurds. It's very difficult to talk about this because there are a few villages in between of the mostly Kurdish district, Yunak of Konya, and non-Kurdish Emirda. And the, lots of people in Emirda, they tend to call them Kurds. And most of them themselves, and especially the Yunak Kurds, they don't accept them to be so. So that has to be investigated. And for me, it's not important what they are genetically or whatever, but how they see themselves and how other people see them. Those two things are for living together the most important things. How do you call your neighbor and how does your neighbor call himself or herself. This is the map I made. Boinuyunlu, a little bit strange name, fat necks. They don't use it very much themselves. Karabal from Karabakh, Kurdish or not. Muhajir, the people from the Balkans, are living in these places. Musunjala and Yuruk. You look in the mountainous areas, I will come to that. And the most important thing to see is that there, is a, there are a lot of borders between the Muslujalu, the most important tribe, and the people from the Balkans. It plays a major role in, uh, in migration. A little excursion to what the concept Yuruk and Turkmen means in nowadays Turkey. You can talk about, for hours and hours about these two things. I think Nurettin Hoja will agree with that. The most important things, and for all the things I will say, there is an exception, and maybe I will give some examples. You can say both are of Turkic origin. But, for example, 
the people in Ispir, in the higher mountains, they call the Kurdish tribes coming from Erzincan also Yuruk, because they are walking, they are traveling. Then some tribal names are strictly bound to one of them. For example, when you talk about Karakoyunlu, you know it's Turkmen. When you talk about Karakechili, it's, it's Yuruk. But a very strange thing that happened last year, I was in Babada, place near one of the big lakes in the south, and there was a guy from Antalya, and he called himself Yuruk. And at the same time, he said, I'm from the Karakoyunlu, and it's a very famous tribe, Uzun Hasan, in northeast of Turkey, who fought with, I think, everybody else. He is one of the tribal leaders of those Karakoyunlu. All Turks know. And he said, I'm Yuruk. I said, why are you calling yourself Yuruk when you are Karakoyunlu? He said, we became Sunni. And when you are Karakoyunlu, you have to be Alevi. Strange thing, but he thinks so. There are Alevi and Sunni among both the Yuruk and the Turkmen. Yuruk is more attached to nomadic lifestyles. When there are villages in a certain area and everybody is sedentarian, then the Yuruks most generally are living on a higher altitude than the Turkmen. But when you go to Kazdar, near Edremit, it's the other way around. The people in the highest villages are called Turkmen, and the people lower are called Yuruk. So you have to take the district situation in account. Uh, when the tribal name has nothing to do with pastoral life, Manav, Tahtaje, we are dealing with Turkmen. OK, let's go to Emira again, to the villages. I will show you three villages of the most important tribes or groups as it was in 2014. So what happened in the migration period, you can see the result of it in the villages. First of all, three Yuruk villages. Again. You can see it's very mixed, tribally, religiously. Alevi, Sunni, Morjale, non-tribal Yuruk, all kind of. Some villages performed very well, for example, Karajalar, almost new houses almost all over the place, and others are still quite poor. At least some of them have their niches in the international migration, Seus Flander, part of Holland, but next to Belgium, from Ghent, people went there. I will show you later on why they went there. Uh, there are not too many Turks living there, but 90% of the Turks in Zeus Vlaanderen is from one valley with three villages. And they make a lot of investments in the village when they have the money. Okay, then Karabale, people from Karabakh, Azerbaijan. There was a sub-district center, Davulga, and some of the other Karabale villages, they did a very, very good job. They have a huge niche in Vienne, in France, and they invest a lot, especially in houses. Then the Boinu Yuvonlu, who were the second important ethnic group in Emirda. And they did not manage to keep up with the Muslujala. You could see the villages were quite traditional, not too much new houses. <coughs> they stay, really, they stay behind. And when you stay behind, you need a coping strategy. And these people, when you talk with them, some of them, they say, 
why should we go to another country? We were rich already. And the second thing, it's, it's even nicer uh, for people who don't know it. Kaye is the part of the Oost tribes who gave this world the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans were Kaye. And these people, they tend to forget the Boinoyunlu name because it's not a very pretty name, Fatneck, because it's very long. You cannot keep it in mind all the time. And when you say Kaye, you can be more proud of yourself. And when you stay behind, you have to be proud. This is the only thing you have left. Then we go to the Muslujale. Most Muslujale place, places, it's difficult to find one old house left. 95% of these houses is empty for over 11 months. They stay there 10 years ago, 15 years ago for six, seven, eight weeks, and now two weeks only, or three, because the children want to go to the sea. They were very successful financially. <coughs> Dominate migration to Belgium. Big investors in houses, but also in land. Very huge status consumption. I will give you one example of it. I was in that village, Firikli. <coughs> there was a guy I knew from the place I live in, in Holland. Let's call him Mustafa also. Most Turks are Mustafa. And uh, Mustafa and his wife were sitting in a very small old house because they wanted to live there, actually. But they had a very nice new house. And he... Uh, made a very big place, a second house for his eldest son, a third house, all of those kinds, very nice houses for his middle son and the last son. He was convinced that he would never come to Turkey again. And they were sitting there. And for the <coughs> Turkish people uh, in here, I can say it in the Emirah uh, dialect, I asked the people, why are you sitting here in the old house? There are three new houses. And the lady, she answered, and she said, Buda yik, Buda ichik, Buda oturik, Oda yatik. <laughs> so they, they ate and they drank, and they sat in the old house, and they slept, only slept in the new house. And the strange thing is, in this village, nobody is selling these houses to a brother, OK to a nephew, OK, someone of the tribe, OK. But outside, to the people working there, coming to work, there, no, never, never. But you can predict when it starts, and someone who is important in the community starts to sell the house, it will, all houses will be sold in one year for a very, very low price. The presence of those neighbors, those people from Bulgaria, was very important to make the first big step to have more land. When you have more land, you can have more production, and you can get real rich. And now these people from these villages, they have land up to Polatle. And that's... And then we go to the last category, the Muhajir, the people from Bulgaria, most of them, some from Romania. Have a look at these villages. Two cars from Istanbul. And when I think about these Muhajir, and when they came, some of them came in 1910, some of them came in 1893, 94, <coughs> in a totally tribal environment. I think about when I went with a bike every day on secondary school to the big city Breda in Holland, and had to pass by a place where those travelers and gypsies lived. We were very afraid. Not because those people were so bad, but you knew that when you had a quarrel with one guy, there would be 60 to assault you. And that's the same thing that happened to these muhajir. They were not organized tribally, and they had to keep quiet, not to go every week to the center city. 
to have their own autarkic way of living, not to get in trouble with the neighbors. Because when you beat up one Muslujala, the whole village will be killed. They killed each other up to the, to the 70s. There were two people from Frikli village killed in Holland in the blood feud. It was going on till everybody got rich, and then it stopped. OK, as autarkic as possible. Only one family from all those villages, some 11 or 12 villages, went abroad. Only one family. And it was because he had a friend from one of the Muslujala villages. <coughs> they sold their land and went to the big cities. Nostalgic annual visits to the old house. <coughs> and these people started to sell houses to the workers. We will come to that too. Their coping strategy is also very nice. As most of them say, we didn't want to have our children speaking a strange language. We wanted to teach them on a proper Turkish university in Turkish. And another thing was, we are Europeans. We came from Europe. And those people, they had some herds. But the real agriculture, they learned it from us which is probably not true, but that's something else. Then the in-migration, migration to Emirda. I said usual suspects. That means people who are selling ice or baking bread. They come from, uh, most of the time, from Rize Pazard, Hemshinli. Uh, beekeepers come from Aydin. So you have the specialities in Turkey, people traveling around with certain occupations. And then the people returning to the home villages, to Emirda city, or to Eskishir. And I take Eskishir as part of the region. <coughs> At the moment, most of the elderly people are living there every winter, because it's too cold. And the children are living in Eskishir. You can go to the shop on the corner. And this is also why people go to Eskishir, of course. Every, anybody visit this? Oh, God. And you think you know Turkey. And then the second part of the in-migration. You have traditionally a lot of people coming from Bolvadin, Gian, Bailey, Yunak. Some of them try to stay at the moment. But lately, it's really strange. People from Ufa, they came up to Polatla. But since the Syrians are pushing in the Antep region, in the Adana region, they are going more west. And people from Afghanistan, lately people from Africa, uh, there was a, the Moroccan government asked Turkey to make a visa uh, uh, obligation for Moroccans, because they think that most Moroccans coming to Turkey want to fight for Ishid and have some occupation for a few weeks and then go on. And there's a Burkina Faso guy in Firikli, South Africa, Somalia. I did not see Syrians yet, but old photograph from the 90s from all those people waiting for work. <coughs> there are people who pay a lot of money to work on land and then sell what <coughs> sell the crops they get out of it. Most people come from Konya. And this is one of the Muhajir villages where those people try to get houses now. Some of the factors that influence this process, the tie with the environment, with the land, is it strong or not? Societal structure tribal or not, <coughs> attitude towards migration, skills and educational level, information position. I think one of the most important things is that, that you know in time what the possibilities are somewhere else in detail, economic position and perspectives, and ethnic hierarchy. When you are low in the hierarchy, the chance that you have all information in time is zero. <coughs> <coughs> mm. 
Then let's go to the diaspora, the case of Ghent, one of the nicest cities of Belgium. I hope you agree. Yes. Uh, it's really, it's so, it's <laughs> marvelous. For the people who know the symbols of the old Democrat party, the, the horse, it's climbing wheelchairs in Belgium lately. Just some photographs. But now we are coming to the real stuff. When you walk through Ghent, you might come across a real Turkish Kangal with youngsters from Emirda. One of them from Bolvadin, by the way, and the others from Emirda. And the Kangal was from Eindhoven in Holland. 1963. There were some Italians in the occupations you can accept from Italians, Spanish housekeepers, both men and women, some 200 North Africans, Algerians from France, Tunisians and Moroccans. No Turks yet, not one of them, but them. From 64 onwards, three groups of Turks, from Posov, a Georgian region in north, far northeast of Turkey, which was really far because there was still the Soviet Union at the time. They couldn't go anywhere. Istanbul, and it were all Balkan refugees. And how it started, I will come to that fast-growing share of Emirda. I had the luck to, in the few days we were there, to meet the writer of this book. She expects, I think, yeah, she expects still her third child. Married with a guy from one of the Emirda villages. It's a very nice book, not very scientific, but very nice stories. Now how it starts for Emirda. It's a mix of the things I heard and read in the book and the things I knew. There was a guy, blind Ahmed Kur Ahmed, from Karazelaj. He went to Brussels in 64, and he sent a letter to his uncle, Jalal. <coughs> the guy went from the Tuesday market and tried to find someone who could read the letter, because most Turks couldn't read at that time. And by accident, I have the letter here. And I will refrain from all those phrases, like I kiss your eyes and all that kind of things. And read the important content. Sorry, I need glasses. Dear uncle, I came to Belgium and found work over here. I'm earning 1,000 liras a month in a factory in Brussels. They pay every month without delay. You might follow my example and join me as soon as possible. The journey costs 4,000 liras. No matter how, just collect this amount of money. As soon as you've got the money, go to Afyon to apply for a passport. Then go by train from Eskishir to Istanbul. Go to Tachtakale neighborhood near the Grand Bazaar. Change your money for marks and francs before the euro. And then go to Sirkeji railway station and take the direct train to Paris. The departure is every Wednesday evening. Be there in time. I will wait for you at Paris railway station. See you soon, Ahmed. Okay. And this guy, he didn't want to go, but the guy who translated the letter, he started to talk about migration. It was in a, a village, Yeruk village, called Turkmenke near Karajalar. And he started to talk, Father, I want to go to Belgium. And the father said, no. In the second evening, he said no again. And after a few months, he said, OK, but I will arrange some company for you, because you are only 17 years old. You know French a bit from the school, but you're only 70. OK. He went. And afterwards, there were more. Then there are two questions. The first is, why Turks instead of more Moroccans, Tunisians? Algerians, which happened with the Moroccans, for example, in Brussels, in Anvers. There are Turks, but there are more Moroccans. 
in both big cities. In Ghent, no, few hundred, no more. And there are 20,000 Turks in Ghent, 200,000 inhabitants, 20,000 Turks, at least 12,000 from Emirat. First question, why Turks? Answer, possible answer. There was a perfect fit with the textile industry. The Algerians from France, they were loners. They didn't have families. They had also a little bit adventurous lifestyle, chasing girls in Ghent, and they were not very popular. And the Turks had families. They were newly married. They had most of the time children. And Belgium, and Belgium encouraged to bring in the families. The textile industry was always trying to get generational uh, workers. Father, son, mother, daughter, come, come, come. And there was, a, there was a lack, a real lack of people working in textile industry. And then, why Emirda instead of more Posov and Istanbul? And that's a very interesting thing when we go to the, my title. Some chains are stronger than others. And in, in Belgium, there was a possibility. You had, of course, the, the big contracts, also with Turkey, to collect workers. But there was also a nominative recruitment possibility. And it was partly formal. You had to contract someone by name, uh, Ahmed uh, X from village uh, in, in this village in Emida. You send him a contract. You pay the travel expenses and bring him to Belgium. That's what happened with a lot of guys from Istanbul, Posov, and some of Emirda. But the Emirda people, they took the informal road. They just went. Because those people from Posov and Istanbul, they had to pay a lot of money when they came to Ghent to those other people from Posov and Istanbul who were already there and tried to get money out of those guys, even when it was family. Maybe some less money, but they try to earn money from their fellow migrants. They uh, asked money for sleeping, asked money for food. They went with them uh, as interpreter to the factories. And the people from Emirda, and it started with a guy called Ghazi Palit, who did everything for free for people from his own the people from the villages he knew, and even sometimes for, from, for others. And it was a, from goatkeeper to gatekeeper, you might say. And the mutual support was really, uh, I think the, the lady who wrote the book, Tina de Gent, she wrote about the people from Emirda, they are so generous. Yeah, they are generous, but why are they generous to these people? Because they have an obligation to do so. And not only for, for your son or your father or your nephew, no, for your whole clan. If you don't do it, you're not part of the family anymore. Um, I don't have all numbers. The strange thing is when you come to the oil crisis, it's not going down. Uh, the recruitment stops officially, but it's going up. And now we are at 20,000 here. I don't know these numbers, but it grows gradually to 20,000. And at least this part is Emilia. The nominative recruitment, we all also talked about it. <coughs> the share of children in Ghent, I don't know the situation for Brussels and Ant Antwerp yet, was 50% already in 70. And that was really new for me. <coughs> 74, the oil crisis, so-called migration stop, because then all the people from Emirda in that uh, time, they had enough money to go on holidays, and they went there with buses, and they came back with more buses, because they said, this is your last chance. Come with us. And then the influx was really gigantic. And the people, uh, also Tina de Gent, but also other scientists, they are talking about replacing of communities. And then you see a nice new phenomenon. Uh, that was, for example, for all Turks, there was 
there was one uh, mosque. But when all those villages came, everybody had its own mosque, own bars and tea houses, and still it's in the end, it's the case that some of the Emirda villages have their own pub, have their own tea house, have their own mosque. <coughs> Growing unemployment amongst men, and then the fish processing in Holland starts, and then the Zeeuwsvaandere communities start to grow. The asylum migration didn't affect Ghent at all. Most of the asylum seekers, especially later on in the 80s, were from Kurdish origin and went to places where no, no Turks were living. Mechelen, for example. What a very nice thing is that I have to research on is that the Piribeli, the people from the Kurdish villages in Emirda, have really a, a very apart status, very special status in Ghent. They are living far from the center in their own community with everything for themselves. And I heard of people who wanted to live there but came back after a month. It's impossible to live there. And the Ghazi Palit guy I talked about, the Yuruk villages, they seem really dominant in Ghent. And they are only a minority in Emirah itself. Some pictures of the Ghent situation, and then it's finished. <coughs> there was one very nice difference with most of the Turkish streets in Holland. The Turkish streets in Holland are really Turkish. And in Belgium, there are 10, 20, 30, 40 Turkish shops but all of them have some things from stove porches or whatever things from the country. For example, there was a, maybe I passed it, let me see. Um, here, for example, it's all Flemish stuff. It's not Turkish. This is Turkish. This is Flemish. In the same shop in Holland, you will never find it. I think I never saw it. Thank you.